Bismillah, salat salam ala rasulullah. Allahumma salli salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yasirli amri. Wahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. So you're all here to um, learn about owning your health. So what, we've, what I've done is I've put in a lot of research into prophetic medicine, Islamic medicine, and herbalism. And I found certain things that I've done for my family and my friends has helped us in our health. And I wanted to sort of put it together as a short one hour class that I can share with everyone. If you're battling with different health issues, the emotional and physical stress that come with it, and you wanna take ownership of your health, this is the right place to be, inshallah. We are going to be discussing three secrets. Uh, the first one being, what is the obstacle that's holding you back from healing? Uh, how do you fully benefit from traditional and Islamic medicine? And what are some simple tips and tricks and herbs that you can use uh, so that you can feel better, inshallah? I want you to close your eyes for a minute and think about what brought you here today. A lot of us are suffering with different health issues, whether it's irritable bowel, uh, PCOS, struggles with infertility, um, food allergies, some people even cancer. Um, every one of us has a pain point because I speak to a lot of people about health. Every single household is suffering from something. And I think a lot of us are in the same boat where we feel that we've hit a, a brick wall with modern medicine. We're not getting the results we want. We're not getting the answers we need. Um, we're often medicated, but that's not really the cure or the solution to the problems that we're looking for. Now, this is a good time to turn off all distractions because it is gonna get intense. There's a lot of learning and there's a lot of new concepts that perhaps you haven't seen or heard of before. So this piece of pie, the first piece of pie is what you know. This is knowledge. And the first part is what you know that you know. So things like you know how to drive, you know how to speak English, you know how to cook, um, you might know math and algebra. There's, these are the things that you know you know how to do and use. The second piece of pie is what you know that you don't know. So for instance, I know I can't fly an airplane. So I know there's knowledge about how to fly an airplane but I know that I can't fly one myself. I know that there are millions of plants and herbs and insects, but I don't know them all. I can't identify them, all of them. So this is what I know that I don't know. That remaining a piece of pie, that huge portion is what we don't know that we don't know. This is where ghafla happens. There's a lot of information and knowledge, um, whether it's about religion or our bodies or health, wellness, parenting, marriage, everything. This whole big piece of pie has a lot of information that we don't even know exists. So we don't even know that we don't know it. Uh, and therefore, we wouldn't know how to apply it. So this is where Rafla happens. And really, the focus of today's one hour class is going to be on that section right there. There's going to be information in there that perhaps you've never had access to this information before. Now, my knowledge is limited. It's always going to be limited. Um, even the collective knowledge of all doctors and scientists, herbalists, is going to be limited. Healing is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It does not come from a pill. It does not come from a herb. Uh, it's not going to come from me or a doctor. These are what's called the medium. The, this is the means of how you might get to healing, the, the guide that Allah might give you. But healing will ultimately come from him. I can't guarantee healing for myself, therefore I can't guarantee it for anybody else. And, and it's also not possible to learn everything about healing from a one hour class, um, not even a book or a course. Uh, it's quite a bit of information. Um, so we're gonna see how much we can get through inshallah. What you will learn today will be from that big piece of pie. This is something that you probably didn't know that you didn't know. And this knowledge is going to impact your health it's going to impact your food choices. It's going to impact how you manage your health with your doctors moving forward. So my name is Iman Attar, and Iman in Arabic means faith. And Attar means the herbalist and perfumist. If you've ever been to the Middle East and you see the um, Attar stands, these are the herbalist shops where they sell essential oils, perfumes, they sell herbs. So they're known as Attar. And I, I actually find it interesting that um, both faith and herbalism have come together in my life 
just as my name actually means. And um, I couldn't have branded it better myself if I tried. I am a researcher and author in prophetic medicine um, and Islamic medicine and herbalism. And I'll explain the differences in, in the next few slides, inshallah. I began studying Islam in 2008. Uh, with all with Al Maghrib Institute as well as Al Kawthar, I took courses in Aqida, Sira, uh, Tafsir, uh, Fiqh of Salah, Fiqh of Marriage, Teskia, uh, the names and attributes of Allah. And I mentioned that because I found that in order for me to have distinguished knowledge with um, herbalism, because there's a lot of uh, there's some witchcraft in herbalism, there's some Kufr and herbalism, there's a lot of things in herbalism that as you're studying it, if you don't have a solid foundation in faith, it can get very mucky. Um, so alhamdulillah that I invested the, a good portion of my life to study Islam first before I had moved on to studying herbalism. And for those who don't know me, back in 2014, uh, almost eight years ago now, I became anaphylactic to peppers. And these are all types of peppers. So jalapenos, chili peppers, sweet peppers, bell peppers, paprika, and then any foods that actually contained it. So even Doritos chips has paprika in it. Um, I would have anaphylactic allergic reactions to it. So it really turned my life upside down. Uh, it made it difficult for me to eat with family and friends. It made, made it difficult for me to eat out. Um, it made me very sick very often because I was accidentally ingesting it from different foods. Um, and it was it was hard for me to know. So I had to learn a lot about food. I had to learn about, well, what's this food made of so that I know what ingredients are in it and therefore I can avoid it or take it. Um, so when I became allergic to peppers, I, I really started burying myself in reading prophetic medicine, different books, uh, medical journals, anything I can get my hands on. I wanted to fix it. I really wanted to fix it so badly that I just wanted my life back. I wanted to go back to eating normally. Um, but alhamdulillah, that that desire to find the cure actually ended up opening up a, a gateway of knowledge that I wouldn't turn back now. Uh, if given the choice to go back to being able to eat peppers and give up what I've learned, I'd, I'd much rather be here today. Uh, although it's still difficult to eat and to eat out, alhamdulillah, I'm much better than where I was before. Um, and the knowledge that I've gained has helped me, it's helped my family, it's helped some of my friends. Um, and I'd like it for that information and knowledge to inshallah help you as well. It was narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, uh, said that Allah has not sent down any disease, but he has also sent down a cure for it. Now, I want you to think if you're on prescription medication, if you're on any medication for your thyroid, if you're on any medication for uh, menstrual irregularities that you've got, any medications for heart disease, blood pressure, cholesterol, are these a cure? No because they don't actually heal you from the condition that you have. What, what these medications do is their disease management. It's to ensure that you know, your issue doesn't escalate. Um, so they're really tackling the symptom and controlling it, but they're not really getting to the root cause of the issue. And they're not really offering you a cure. You're not gonna one day be able to get off of the medication, not unless you do something drastic, um, such as changing your lifestyle or your diet. There has to be a lot more research as to what's causing it. and then getting to that root cause and changing it, inshallah. So then the question is, can we truly heal? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he has not sent down a disease, except he sent down a cure for it. So we know that there's a cure. There's a cure for everything that's out there. Um, it's up to us to take ownership of our health and say, I'm going to make sure I find the cure for my condition. I'm going to figure out what's causing it. And therefore, I'm going to help myself heal. And so you're in charge. This is where you're, you have to be involved in your health. Um, I think it's important to understand the history of medicine in order to know where we're coming from, where does prophetic medicine fit in, why do I call Islamic medicine separate from prophetic medicine, and then how does modern medicine fit into the whole picture. If we don't understand our history, uh, then we won't really understand where we are and where we're going. Um, ancient Egyptian medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine, Greek medicine, they all believed in a different concept of disease compared to what modern medicine believes in right now. And so all the way up to Islamic medicine, with just before we get to modern medicine, the concept of disease was considered an imbalance. 
in the body. So your body's imbalanced. That's why you've got high blood pressure. Your body's imbalanced. That's why you've got diabetes. Um, your body's imbalanced. That's why you're getting sick with flus and viruses and bacterial infections. Your body was considered a terrain. It's considered like the soil. So if it's imbalanced, it's going to become a breeding ground for diseases to grow. Now, modern medicine sort of began with the germ theory. And the germ theory is that diseases attack us. So you get um, germs that attack the body. Therefore, you're going to need um, antibiotics. You need to pasteurize milk because milk has bacteria. So that's where the concept of, um, of disease changed. And therefore, the actual medical systems changed. So Everything up until Islamic medicine is completely different from what modern, modern medicine teaches. And don't forget, modern medicine is only about 150 years old. So we've got over 5,000 years of knowledge that has been buried or lost. And most people don't even know what medicine looked like um, just 500 years ago. Now, prophetic medicine is different from all types of medicine. Prophetic medicine is superior because it is from divine revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down revelation with specific instructions re regarding our health. Uh, so there's uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he taught us with regards to hygiene, he taught us with health, nutrition, medicine. He didn't give us the complete science of medicine. This isn't something that was part of um, the seerah. There are specific ahadith pertaining to medicine. So I'll give you an example. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions black seed. Everybody knows kalonji, black seed, nigella sativa, it's all the same herb. There is mention of this herb in prophetic medicine so that it's a cure for all diseases. This was revealed by Allah because nothing that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said was from his own whims or desires. It was all through revelation. So if you think of prophetic medicine compared to Greek or Chinese medicine, I've drawn that white line, that white bar, so that you can see that there was divine intervention with this particular medicine. And it, it didn't necessarily teach new concepts of medicine, but it really came down to say that this was correct medicine and this was incorrect medicine. And that this is where you have to, um, this is where it taught doctors and scientists which direction they should continue their studies in. So for example, hijama was always used in Chinese medicine. It's not new, but prophetic medicine emphasizes that hijama is one of the ways that we're supposed to use for healing. So when I teach, I'm going to make sure that I distinguish the things that are prophetic medicine. And when it's when I say it's prophetic, that means there's a specific hadith pertaining to that herb, to that medical or therapeutic uh, modality that we're supposed to use. When I say Islamic medicine, Islamic medicine is actually different. Islamic medicine is where Muslim scientists became the forerunners of medical research and advancement. And what they did is they used the Islamic principles taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we know, you know, you shouldn't cause harm to the body. There shouldn't be alcohol there. You know, there are specific rules as to what you can and cannot use in medicine. And then based obviously on things like the understanding of the nafs, the understanding of sihr, the understanding of uh, evil eye and all of these things, they were able to complete a completely, create a completely different medicine. So what what Islamic medicine does is it takes Greek medicine, it takes Chinese medicine, takes Ayurveda, and it also takes Persian medicine, and then it Islamifies it. It takes all the concepts of traditional medicine, and then it only uses the parts that fit within Islam's guidelines. And then they build on that. So if you think of Ibn Sina, known as Avicenna in Latin, his books and his research that he had done, um, and are, we're not here to debate whether he was, you know, an upright Muslim, or, you know, deviant, not deviant, this, that's not the objective of it. it. The objective is he was taking the concept of Islam and he was using them towards medicine. And then his books, he wrote five books called the Canon of Medicine. His five books were actually used to teach medicine in universities across Europe for over 600 years. So Islamic medicine has a huge history. Um, and it isn't only up until 150 years ago that we begin to see so much of that history being erased. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of our Muslim doctors and scientists are no longer pursuing Islamic medicine. They've just all moved over to the modern medicine concept, um, which, which has its limitations and issues as well. So we are going to discuss the three secrets because I promised to owning your health. 
But before, I want you to think about horses for a minute. Yes, because we all love horses um, and horses are sunnah. But if you notice, horses are different in body structure. You will have draft horses or Bulgarian horses that'll be used to plow the earth. You will have small, fast, agile horses like Arabian horses that would be used for racing or for wars. And you have to wonder, how is it that they can all eat grass, but they can all look so different? And the answer to that is, is that they all have a predisposition, a different body type uh, categorized. So you'll have a different category of body types for horses. And just the same way we have different body types for human beings. And that's the first reason why a lot of people are having issues with their health is that we all eat the same diet. We all take the same medications. It's supposed to be one size fits all. That's the way modern medicine and modern nutrition works, but it's not, it's not the case. There are four different body types in Islamic medicine, and these body types respond differently to food. Uh, they have different structures, different metabolisms, different appetite. So we can't treat everyone's sickness the same way. If you don't know the body type, you really can't give them a treatment. And modern medicine is treating everybody the same way, regardless of whether or not they're different in, in structure. So these are the four body types in Islam, in Islamic medicine. We have melancholic, which is called soda in Arabic and black bile, choleric, uh, safra in Arabic and bile. Now, the, where, you, where it says bile, blood, phlegm, that actually does relate to the bodily fluids that we have. Uh, black bile doesn't really exist in our body, but it pertains more to the nervous system. Sanguine is known as dem, blood, and then phlegmatic, which is belgum and phlegm. Now, this is where the bone structure test and the wrist test that I gave you earlier work. So if we all do it again, you're taking your shahada finger, your thumb, you're wrapping it around your wrist, and you want to see, does it touch? Does it have a gap? Does it overlap a little bit? Or does it overlap a lot? And the reason you want to know that is because that's going to help you determine your body type. So if you, if you overlap significantly and you have a tiny bone structure, then you are melancholic. So that first picture on the left, that's melancholic. And in the next slide, I'll show you what that means because your diet and your body structure and how you metabolize food is completely different from someone who's like me. I, I have a large bone structure. There's significant space when I try to close my fingers. I have a phlegmatic body type. So my reactions to food and, and diet and metabolism is completely different from someone who would be melancholic. So melancholics are considered to be the opposite of what is naturally balanced. And the reason for that is, is that we are designed to be warm and moist uh, or warm and wet. And that balance is actually sanguine, it's blood. So your blood is warm, it's wet, this is where the balance is. Um, melancholic tends to be cold and dry. And melancholic body types tend to have uh, a nervous stomach. So they don't eat very well. They don't have a lot of appetite. They can't gain weight even if they tried. Uh, they don't build muscle very well. Um, they might suffer from IBS and uh, a colicky stomach. So food isn't their friend. It's not necessarily, uh, they don't, spend as much time, I think, with food as, as much as the other body types would have interest in. Um, now, what, I, what I've done here is I've put together some ideas for how to nourish a melancholic body type is that you wanna make sure that because they have a colicky sensitive stomach, you wanna give them foods that are easy to digest. You don't wanna give them, uh, you don't wanna give them difficult food. So I'll give you an example. Steak would be considered difficult to digest. Uh, whereas steamed vegetables or uh, bone broth or a stew would be considered easy to digest. Even though a stew has meat, the process of how a stew is made, it breaks down the fibers of the meat so it's easier to digest than a steak that you grill for 15 minutes on the stove. A stew would cook for maybe two to three hours and the, the meat is quite soft, whereas a steak, you might put it on the grill for 10, 15 minutes. And so it's a lot chewier and it's a lot harder for your body to break it down. Now, because melancholics have that nervous system, what I recommend in terms of herbs is anything that would be calming and soothing to the nervous system. So fennel, anise, lavender, lemon balm, lemon, verbe lemon, ver lemon verbena, <laughs> chamomile, 
these are all calming herbs. Now I've included sage and rose because sage is actually very good for, di for digestion. If you eat meat, um, sage actually helps you digest your meat, which is why they use it in a lot of recipes. Uh, and rose is also very calming for the stomach and the nervous system. So this is what, and this is all gonna be in the book that you're gonna get at the end of the uh, lecture. So I definitely think that you should stick around till the end because that's gonna be important. So this is just a brief look at melancholics. Uh, now, everybody wants to know what does a melancholic look like or any body type for that matter. So we've put together, my daughter and I spent hours <laughs> trying to go through images of different actors and actresses to see whose body type would fit into each of the four body types. Melancholics would be somebody like Angelina Jolie, Celine Dion, uh, Nicole Kidman. You would notice that melancholics usually have long fingers, which is why when they wrap around their wrists, they have a significant overlap. Um, their hands tend to be quite long. Their bone structure tends to be quite tiny. And no matter how much they, these actors try to put on weight, they, they wouldn't be able to um, in even muscle. So that's another thing to keep in mind, especially if you're raising kids uh, with you know, self-esteem issues and body, body image issues, is that you want them to sort of understand their body type. Um, guys with melancholic body types or choleric body types tend to have uh, self-consciousness with regards to their inability to build muscle. And we kind of have to help them frame that mindset as to, well, your body's designed for this. Um, it's not designed to be necessarily that. It's not to say that they can't build muscle, but they're not going to be beefed up like a, a sanguine or a phlegmatic body type would. Uh, now, calorics are considered to have the most catabolic and hottest, um, most active of all temperaments. They have a very fiery digestive system. Um, you would find them, these are people who can get really angry when they're hungry because their, their stomach is just burning. They really need to eat. Um, and their body processes food fast and they probably eliminate food very fast. Um, some caloric body types might use the bathroom two to three times for bowel movements to, to flush out. Uh, whereas melancholics or phlegmatics might have a, a little bit slower. Um, body structure is they are lean. Uh, they can put on weight, but their weight will tend to be around the belly and a little bit in the face, uh, but they're not going to get really big all over. They might have um, definitely a ravenous appetite, very fast metabolism. And you'll notice that uh, they can their stomach can burn through anything. So they will tend to want to eat a lot of meat. They will tend to want to eat a lot of spicy foods, a lot of heavy meals. Um, salad would not suffice. Uh, like a light meal with salad and fish would, would not suffice. They'd feel like they hadn't eaten at all. Uh, but that actually is what's needed because this is a body type that can metabolize so much nutrients that they can end up with high blood pressure. They can end up with high cholesterol. Uh, they can end up with gout. So there's a lot of issues that they can end up with. So it's important to include more vegetables into the diet, include cooling foods into the diet, things that are easier to digest as well, not constantly give it heavy meals. And then also there's herbal teas that can be used to help uh, cool the fire in their system. Uh, licorice root is actually a demulcent. Uh, it's not for everyone. So if, if someone has high blood pressure or heart disease, definitely not a herb that I would recommend that they use, but everything else on the list is pretty safe. I mean, it, all herbs are safe, even licorice is safe in, in the right dosage, but I wouldn't ask someone to experiment with it off the get-go. Uh, hibiscus is cooling. If you've ever had hibiscus, uh, you would know that it would help cool down the stomach. Mint tea helps cool down the stomach, pomegranate tea. Now, I did specify which herbs specifically for which body types, because sometimes mint tea might not work for someone who's phlegmatic, because if they already have a slow digestive system, giving them something that's going to cool it off even more is not necessarily um, what they would need. So I've really tried to focus on each body type, what herb would be best for that body. And now celebrities with the choleric body types, someone like Tom Holland, Charlie Theron, Ben Stiller, and Hathaway, they're, they're still quite small framed. You would notice it. It's, it's evident they don't put on a lot of weight or a lot of muscle. Um, if they did gain weight, like I said, it would probably be in the um, abdomen and uh, in the face. You might notice a little bit more plump in the cheeks. Um, and then we've got sanguine, which is considered the most balanced 
uh, of the body type. So really blood body type sanguines can eat anything they want and they can drink anything they want. Um, but the only issue that this body type would have is that if they're eating too much. So people would have to know what proportions are balanced for that body type. And then what happens is if you're eating too much of one type of food, so if you are eating a lot of dairies and wheats and cooling foods, you might slow down your system. You might start to put on weight. You might start to develop colds and flus more often and a wet cough. These are all signs that your phlegm humor in your body is actually becoming disbalanced. So we have we have blood in our body and phlegm and, and bile and black bile. All of us have these, but the, the constitution, the body types is your predisposition. This is what you are born with. This does not change. Um, your balance can change. You could become a little bit more like your disease or condition could be a phlegmatic condition, but it's, but your actual structure will always remain um, as sanguine or as phlegmatic, whatever your, your actual base is and celebrities with sanguine. So Jessica Alba, Bruce Willis, Jessica Biel, Keanu Reeves. Again, you will notice that these are actors that you've probably seen their weight shift. Uh, you've seen them build muscle and you've seen them lean. Uh, these are people who have the ability to build the muscle. Um, and they can definitely, I mean, no body type, I mean, maybe with exception to melancholic, no body type is safe from gaining weight. Everybody can gain weight if they're eating in excess or if they're eating the wrong foods for their body. Um, but sanguines tend to be the most balanced and, but can easily get disbalanced if they're not eating right. And last is phlegmatic. Um, now phlegmatic is considered cold and wet. Uh, so this is already the precondition that the body has. Um, a lot of people who are phlegmatic might be asthmatic. Uh, they might get recurrent colds and flus, ear infections. Uh, these are the, just things that because their body is already damp and cold, they're gonna be very sensitive to the weather change as well. And um, their body is considered conserving of energy. So their bowels are slow and sluggish. Uh, they're, they're not, they, they don't do well with heavy meals. If you eat a heavy meal as a phlegmatic body type, uh, your body might need eight hours to digest it or to process it and feel hungry again, whereas a caloric might be hungry again in three or four hours. So it's just a slower digestive system. Um, and the best way to eat if you're phlegmatic, uh, and again, this is not an exhaustive list of foods. Um, all foods are safe for everybody. Uh, it's just where you focus more on. So to do well as a phlegmatic body type, focusing on more fruits, veggies, salads, um, easy to digest grains like oats and quinoa and barley. Uh, you can still have dairy like yogurt and kefir, but you wouldn't wanna go too crazy with cheeses and milk. Uh, fermented vegetables actually help uh, boost the metabolism and the heat. Uh, chicken, fish, beef, lamb. Um, actually lamb is more warming for the body and I'll explain that in the next few slides as well. But beef would probably be my, my least you know, pick for a phlegmatic body type because that tends to be harder to digest. Um, again, herbs, um, you'll notice that I use sage, licorice, rose very often because they, they have so many healing properties and they're so good for so many different um, body types and different conditions that I almost include it for everyone. I think everyone can have them and, and still be safe because they help you digest your food. They help, like rose helps women with their hormones. So that's something that I would include in someone's daily a daily diet if I could. Now, the other thing I consider for phlegmatic body types is I would include warming um, teas, like with warming spices, like apple and cinnamon, anything that has ginger spice teas, like with cloves. Um, I, yeah, I think you, you get what I mean. <laughs> now, celebrities with phlegmatic body types. I think the, the first person that comes to mind for me is always Oprah Winfrey. Um, it's been iconic she's got that body type and phlegmatic body types also have a smaller upper body and then they do a lower body. So if you're a size 12 on the bottom, you might be a size 10 on top or, or like a medium on the top and a small, a large on the bottom. So there's always that, it almost feels disproportionate. The body type is that they tend to be heavier bottom than they are on the top. Um, no matter how skinny a phlegmatic body type gets, they always still feel like they're bigger than everybody else. And that's because their bone structure is bigger. So 
Um, I think that's especially important for young girls that are developing, especially if they're watching movies or if they have access to magazines. There's everybody in Hollywood for the women are melancholic or caloric. So that constant projection of different body types really affects young girls growing up. So it's important for them to understand their body, understand uh, the benefits of the structure that they've been given, what they can do with it. Um, I think it's really important that we teach our young generation that, inshallah. So I coughed for two years straight, and this was before I had become allergic to peppers. Um, I was coughing every day, morning, noon, and night. It didn't matter what I did. Uh, I was always coughing, and doctors were always prescribing inhalers for me. Um, and I got to a point where uh, it was just unbearable. It was extremely difficult. And I think one night my husband got so frustrated with my like recurrent cough that he just gave me a clove and he said, eat this. And I said, what do you mean eat this? And he says, just eat it, like put it in your mouth and eat it. And to my surprise, it actually calmed down my cough. It, it acted as a antispasmodic. So it stopped that irritation in the lungs and cloves are also warming. It's a warming spice. Um, it, it makes you feel hotter on the inside. So eating that actually helped dry out the cold wetness that I was experiencing in my lungs. And again, that was before I had just become allergic to peppers. That was one of the, you know, initial phases where I started to take interest in herbalism that, you know, here I could find natural foods that could help me get rid of this annoying cough and not rely on inhalers uh, every day for the rest of my life. And one of the things that came up from learning all about this, you know, from the herbs to the um, is that it, after my allergies is that as I started to do all this research, one of the things that came up is that just the same way we have different energetics in our body, so we can be hot, cold, or wet and dry, food actually has the same temperaments and they have that effect on our body. So the foods that are warming for the body are things that would be like seeds and nuts. Um, if you take a spoon of honey, you can feel an immediate surge of heat in your body, the same way as if you ate a piece of ginger. Um, obviously, anyone who's had chili peppers feels that rush of heat in their body. And that warms up the metabolism. It's, it, it's actually better for, your, for the digestive system, so long as it's not in excess. Uh, but it, it helps warm it up and dry some of the things. So that's by balancing foods and knowing what to eat, you actually can improve the condition of your body on the inside. There's also cooling foods. Now, if you've ever been hot on a summer day, your body instantly craves things like watermelons and cucumbers because the body knows what's gonna cool it off. Uh, milk, if anyone's ever had milk, you, you would know instantly that it, it causes cold dampness in your system. No, I'm not demonizing milk. In fact, I, I'm a huge advocate for milk. I think it's extremely healthy. And I discuss that later in, um, in my book and in the course that's coming up, inshallah. But there are certain foods that are going to be good for you, depending on the combination, depending on your condition, depending on so many variables. And what I'd like to do is sort of teach you how to combine all of these. Um, you, you certainly wouldn't want to be doing cooling foods in the winter. So eating watermelon in the winter is not going to be good for you. Um, drinking coconut water in the winter is not going to be good for you. Or if you have a cough, drinking cold, uh, anything, cold ice water, cold smoothies is not going to be good for you. One of the things that came up, up for me was during all the times that I was coughing and I was sick and I had these food allergies, I ended up seeing a naturopath. And the naturopath did what all naturopaths recommend is that you get off dairy and you get off wheat. And then she told me to get on to morning smoothies. And so I was supposed to make a smoothie every morning with frozen fruits, uh, cold oat milk, almond milk, whatever I could get. And I tried that and I actually felt worse. Um, and that's because they were all cooling foods. The fruits were cold, the milk was cold. Um, my body was already suffering from cold dampness and the morning smoothies were actually terrible for my metabolism. So I had to stop that. And it was more as I learned to readjust my diet and readjust the herbs that I was beginning to use as, as how I started to feel better. I want you to have the best of both worlds. And that's where, you know, secret number two is. I'm not asking you to throw out modern medicine because obviously there are things in modern medicine that are extremely important, extremely beneficial for all of us. 
Uh, but I also don't think that we should abandon Islamic medicine either. I think we need to have the best of both worlds. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any medical practitioners um, accessible to all of us. I, at least it's difficult. It's been difficult for me to find a doctor who knows Islamic medicine and who knows modern medicine. I think these are important if we can find someone who could do both, because if they understood the body types, they understood the cooling and warming effects of foods, they understood how to use herbs, but they also understood the diagnostics of modern medicine, when to intervene with antibiotics, when you know you need to have surgery. This would help us really get the perfect picture of health. Um, I do believe that both are needed. And I hope that maybe in our upcoming generations that we would find people who would take interest in Islamic medicine and revive it and take interest in, mod in modern medicine and sort of merge the two together, inshallah. Now, I don't think anybody should be following their um, doctors blindly, the same way you wouldn't be following a sheikh blindly or um, a marriage counselor or any business advice. It's your body, it's your health, you need to take ownership of it, you need to manage it, you need to decide what's best for it and what's not best for it. You have the right to say no. And I know that I've experienced this in the medical system where doctors will often push what's protocol. Um, and I know, for instance, one example is when my son was suffering with irritable bowel syndrome, the doctor, the gastrointestinologist wanted to prescribe anti-anxiety medication. And my son said, why would I take that? I don't have anxiety. I have an irritable bowel that's bothering me and I need to figure out what's, what's causing it to bother me like that. And well, they said, well, you know, we could just try it and see if you feel better. Um, we have to be able to say no. We have to be able to research. We have to be able to seek other opinions. Uh, this is your body, you have to take ownership of it. If you leave it for other people to make that decision for you, then you're gonna end up being sometimes sent in certain vicious circles where you're constantly medicated and then your conditions could get worse and then you're medicated even more. And then once you get stuck in that loop, it's really hard because there's no magic pill, there's no magic herb to take you out of that. It's a huge lifestyle transformation in order for you to get balance if, you're, if you become that disbalanced. And the more medications that you're on, the more disbalanced your body will become. So our, our third secret then is we really just want to focus on restoring balance to the body. And you can do that with diet. You can do that with herbs. You can do that with managing your health in ways that make sense. So I'm not, again, I'm not against antibiotics. I've taken it. I've given it to my kids. I'm not against painkillers, there, there's a time and place for everything. But I definitely think that uh, we can't just go with the status quo. We have to dig a little bit deeper and see what's, um, what else is available for us to actually heal. Because we want the cure. We don't want to just medicate. So this is what a simplified version of your health would look like. Uh, and this is all from traditional medicine. Everybody believed in your body has a balance. And then if you get disbalanced based on your constitution, the foods that you're eating and the current health condition that you're, you have, they would have to figure out how to rebuild that balance. So if, if for instance, I have someone who has a cold, um, wet cough, even if their constitution was, let's just say phlegmatic, I'm going to choose the foods and the herbs that are going to help them get that balance back. Um, so this is one of the first herbs I started to use was black seed. And I had come across this hadith where Abu Hurairah anhu narrated that the messenger of Allah Sallallahu said, in black seed, there's healing for every disease except Sam. And Sam means death. And black seed is, is also called Shanuz. It's called Kalonji. It's called Najala Sativa. It goes by different names. It's not cumin. It's not the cumin seed. It's not the onion seed. It comes from uh, a particular flower and it has a very strong, bitter taste. Uh, but I've used it on everything. I've used it on myself. I've used it on family and friends. Uh, I highly recommend that everybody try it. And black seed is safe enough that I can even give it to my kids. So my kids, my daughter is two years old, and she, she takes a pinch of black seed and she chews it. Now, there's a hadith where people often say to me, oh, you're only allowed to take seven black seeds. That's the maximum quantity you can take because of a certain hadith. The hadith actually relates to grinding the seven seeds and snuffing them. So snuffing is where you 
inhale it through your nose, you obviously wouldn't want to do a teaspoon of that through your nose. You would have to do a very small quantity and seven was the amount that was recommended. But if you're eating it, if you're ingesting it, then a quarter of a teaspoon um, in the morning, you could even do a quarter of a teaspoon three or four times a day if you're fighting an infection. So it's, it, it's a lot more than people think. And so sometimes when people try herbs and they say it doesn't work for me, it's not because it doesn't work. Sometimes it's because the, dosa the, the dosage is wrong. Um, black seed is from prophetic medicine, although it was used in traditional medicine. So you would find it in Indian medicine, Ayurvedic medicine. It's not new. It wasn't something that was just discovered at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but it was something that it was specified that this particular herb, because there are thousands and hundreds and thousands of herbs out there. Um, when Allah guides you to one and says, this one's going to take care of everything, then you want to make sure that it's in your medicine cabinet. You want to make sure that it's in your car and your purse. This is something that you have to have. I use it for everything. If someone has a headache, I'll use it. If someone's coughing, I'll use it. Now, it doesn't mean that I won't use other things with it, but it's always part of the regimen. There's no way that I would, uh, for myself or anyone, that I would recommend to do something without the inclusion of black seed. So black seed has to be in there. The other thing with regards to black seed is a lot of people don't like the taste, so they resort to the oil and they say, I'm just going to take a teaspoon or a tablespoon of the oil every day. The oil is only about 40% of the entire black seed. And so the black seed has carbohydrates, proteins, oils, uh, minerals. When you extract only the oil, you're not getting the other components. So once you separate it, you're not getting all the medicine that it's supposed to have in it. Uh, it's not going to have the same type of effect as if you were to take the seed. So I do recommend that you chew a quarter of a teaspoon of the seeds, chew it, swallow it, and you can start to then notice the differences in your body. It is a diuretic. Um, I actually had a friend of mine, she was in her 60s and she was diabetic and her husband was diabetic and she was at my house and I happened to mention to her black seed and I said, try this, take a quarter of a teaspoon every day. And she did that. And after three months, she had another appointment with her doctor for to test on her diabetes. And he had said to her that hers had significantly dropped compared to her husband. And she said the only difference between me and my husband, because we eat the same diet, was that I was taking the black seed and he wasn't. Um, I know I know that it works. I, um, the thing that I would recommend for the oil, though, is anything topical. So if you've got a child who's coughing, you can rub the black seed oil on the chest and you would it immediately opens up the airways. Now, I because I'm asthmatic and because I do get coughs and colds a lot, this is something that I do struggle with based on my body type, especially if I eat poorly, then I always know that I have to take care of my lungs that way and black seed oil rubbing on the chest, I actually can feel the difference of how the airways open up. Uh, so it's, uh, it's quite impressive. And I highly recommend that if you haven't tried it to try it and make sure that it's with you in everywhere you go, it should be part of your medicine cabinet for sure. Um, so it's, it's amazing for bronchitis, asthma, and any skin disorders, liver, it actually helps in producing milk as well. So it's even safe for mothers that are breastfeeding. Um, it, it's amazing for infections, uh, immune support. It's considered an immunomodulator. So there's a lot of research that was done on black seed that if you have high blood pressure, it lowers it. And if you've got low blood pressure, it actually increases it. So it, it balances everything in the body. Um, so get on the black seed. Uh, now, hijama and honey. There's a hadith where the Prophet Muhammad says healing is in three things, a gulp of honey, cupping and branding with fire. But I forbid my followers from using the cauterization, which is the branding with fire. The interesting thing about hijama and honey is that honey is warming to the body. So if you're cold, take a tablespoon of honey and you can actually feel how the heat will actually get, go all the way to your hands and feet. So anyone suffering with cold hands and feet, take a tablespoon of honey and you, you would feel the difference in your body. Hijama, it has the opposite effect. If you do hijama, it actually cools the body down. So it helps if you have excessive heat in your body, hijama is going to help reduce that, which is why if anyone's ever had a hijama session, they tell you not to eat meat or dairy after your hijama session for about a day or two. And the reason a lot of hijama therapists recommend that is because that your digestive fire weakens, uh, which is your digestion. It weakens because all that energy is going back to rebuilding the blood. And you don't want to have competing energy. So you wouldn't want to go and eat something heavy that requires a lot of blood in order for it to be digested. Um, it's just an, I thought it was interesting how 
the the hadith has you know the honey and the cupping and and both have the opposite effect on the body so now licorice root this isn't prophetic medicine this would be considered islamic medicine it was part of chinese medicine and e egyptian medicine for a long time um, it was actually found in king tut's tomb and they they have manuscripts as to the kind of things that licorice would help with diseases and ailments Licorice is a huge drink in the Middle East. You would find a lot of people calling it sous. There are people in the street who would walk around making this um, almost like an iced tea concoction where you're drinking this black licorice. Um, and what licorice does is actually it works on your phlegm humor in your body. So if you ever have a cold, a wet cough, if you ever have sinuses that are congested and it's just hard for you to get that congestion out, drinking a cup of licorice tea loosens mucus in the body. It actually loosens the phlegm. It allows it to run. And now imagine what that does if you're having it on a regular basis. And licorice is safe enough that you can have it every day, so long as it's in the right dose. Um, it's Again, it's not meant for people who have heart conditions. It's not meant for people who have high blood pressure. Um, definitely not to be taken when pregnant because it can affect the, the fetal heart development. So there are some cautions with licorice, but it's an amazing herb that I definitely recommend that you should learn more about and you should have in your medicine cabinets at home, uh, not to be afraid of it. There's nothing scary about licorice root. Uh, it actually is considered a peacemaker. It was used a lot um, when making different herbal formulations because it allows patients to like the, med uh, you know, the, the medicine formula because it, it has a sweet taste. It's almost sweet like sugar, but it's not, it has zero calories, zero sugar in it. Um, it's a demulcent. So if you have a sore throat, it actually helps soothe it. If you have a dry cough, it helps soothe it. If you have a wet cough, a congested cough, it helps soothe it. So uh, it's, it's an antiviral, antibacterial, uh, it modulates inflammation. Um, it's just, it's really good for the colon as well, because it hydrates it. So it, it's got so many benefits that I wouldn't want you to be afraid of using it. Um, just, just learning how to use it is important. So coughs, eczema, constipation, um, sore throat, fatigue, all of these things. I've, I've tried it. Actually, we had a friend of ours um, a few months ago who was struggling with a cough for, I think, two weeks. He was struggling with a cough. And he had been on medication for two weeks with the doctors. And he just, he wasn't getting any better. And he finally asked my husband, he said, does your wife know anything that I could take that can help with this? And I had recommended how to make um, a licorice root concoction for him with a few other herbs. And within 24 hours, his cough had subsided and he had been coughing for over two weeks and, and it was extremely painful for him. So, and he, he was feeling very weak and tired from the coughing. So it has, it has huge benefits. I wouldn't discount it for sure. Our time's almost up. We've got eight minutes and I'm going to have to zip through the rest of the slides because I talk too much as I've been told. So if you are interested in learning more um, and if you feel that there's so much more about your constitution that you'd like to know, if you want to unleash and harness the benefits of your body type and what you can, uh, what you can do with different foods and different herbs, then I'm happy, honored, pleased to announce that uh, I've been working on a masterclass. Um, this is our foundational masterclass. It's the first one that I, I'll be doing. Um, I'm going to be focusing on teaching you know, with over, it's over 12 hours, the, the actual course, plus there's live sessions. So it's a six week course, about two hours per week. Uh, one hour would be live so that we can have question and answer. And what this course is going to do is it really is going to help teach you how your body functions. It's going to teach you what herbs, what remedies that you could be doing for different things. So it's a very detailed course that's meant to actually help you heal with you and your family. And it's going to give you the right questions and the right things to do when you're going to the doctor. Like what, what else am I supposed to ask for? What kind of testing can I do? Uh, what, should, what can I say yes to and no to. So it's really going to help equip you with how to manage your health and your family's health. Um, modern biomedicine has really become all about suppressing the symptoms. There really isn't much focus on nutrition. And I'm talking about doctors. I'm not talking about naturopaths. And I'm not talking about um, 
functional medicine, there's a huge movement with functional medicine that the only thing I find lacking with functional medicine is that they don't really focus on the body types. So you're only, you know, you're still all being treated the same way. And I don't think that that's the right way to do it. I really think that how I get sick versus how someone who's caloric or melancholic gets sick is different because of the, the foundation that we come with. And that has to be taken in consideration when we get a treatment plan. Um, I like the idea of having a customized treatment plan from my doctor specifically for me and not just following a protocol. I mean, the, the numbers are staggering. I, imagine 4.69 billion prescriptions were written in 2021, just in the United States. Uh, medical doctors in the USA get barely 20 hours of nutrition education. Now, if, if heart disease and high blood pressure and cholesterol are all caused by imbalanced diet, then why aren't our doctors educated more with regards to nutrition? Why are they only educated? They're ed educated more in actually how to prescribe more than they are educated with how to prevent and cure. And I know that Americans are searching for answers because they're spending 30 billions a year on alternative medicine, $30 billion a year, because the 4.69 billion prescriptions are not helping. So what we don't realize is that the lack of focus on nutrition and the excess use of pharmaceuticals is negatively affecting our health. And it's really up to us to take charge and own it. So this begs the question, why does it not seem to be working? Uh, why is it such a challenge to manage your health and the health of your family? I know so many people that are struggling. Um, and they, again, I'm, one of my friends, she's, she's in a situation where she's struggling with PCOS and the doctors are, you know, sending her in circles and, and pretty much at the end of the day, they just want her to accept that, well, this is the way it is. And, you know, you might be stuck with infertil infertility for life and there's nothing you can do about it. All they have is prescription medications, but I've shown her that there's, there's stories and there's cases of people who have naturally healed from things like PC PCOS. There are people who have healed from cancer naturally. Um, so we have to believe that's, that's one of the most important things is that we really have to believe that we can heal. Four minutes left. So the only way to find the solution is to go back to Allah. We have to go back to the source of healing, which is Allah, the education that he's given us, which is the prophetic medicine, and then the building off the pr prophetic medicine, which is the Islamic medicine. We really have to go back to that and continue the legacy of Islamic medicine. But what I'm offering here today is that I'd like you to take the class with me. Um, this will teach you about seven therapies and how to implement them for you and your family. The courses are divided into several modules. We do focus on prophetic medicine, traditional medicine. We focus on nutrition. Um, it's six weeks. It's divided into four parts with several modules, uh, approximately two hours of intensive learning. Uh, but there's there's also room for the live seminar with me where you get to ask questions and we get to test things out together. So it's, it should be a lot of fun learning, inshallah. Um, I do, I have divided the course into four parts. The, the first section that I focus on is belief, because if we don't believe certain things about how we're designed and how we're supposed to heal and how our body is made, then it's going to be very difficult for us to um, actually progress and implement the things that you're going to learn. The, the second thing is knowledge. Once you have the right knowledge about how your body functions and what foods are, you know, which foods are heating, cooling, how to combine foods together, um, what foods are good for, you know, different illnesses. Um, and then you'll, you'll learn a lot of hard truths. Unfortunately, there's a lot of truth as to why we are where we are today with modern medicine. Um, and then the end of the, the course, the part four is where I really get to empower you with how to take care of your health. So which herbs to use to feel confident to, to test things and measure things within yourself and your family um, to make to give you the strength so that you can take care of yourself and your family, and not feel disempowered whenever one of my kids gets sick, I always thank Allah that I have the knowledge to know enough about the body, that I can help them that I understand that okay, when they have a fever, they shower four or five times a day sometimes when they have a fever, because I, I know that the water is going to be far more effective than the anti-fever medication, right? So I understand how the body works. I want them to heal. I want them to heal faster. I want the same for you, inshallah. This is some of the people that I have helped in the past with regards to the situations that they were going through. So I mentioned Wakar and the situation that he was in with his cough. Um, 
there was another person that I was speaking to. He's a hygiene specialist. So he was quite well versed in herbs and prophetic remedies. Uh, it was part of his life. He, when he got COVID, you know, I'd reached out to him and I said, let me know if you need anything. And he was struggling with his cough. And so I, I showed him how to use the licorice root and he was blown away at how simple the remedy could be and how much better he felt immediately. Alhamdulillah. Um, another person that I'd worked with, she was struggling with GERD and I helped her, you know, understand that not acid reflux and GERD isn't always um, excesses, excessive stomach acid. Sometimes it comes from actually low stomach acid. Your body is not able to break down the food. So it keeps producing more acid and it's, it's trying and it's struggling. So what, what I did with her is I actually suggested for her to take apple cider vinegar and test out if it made her feel better. And just by tweaking her diet, she was blown away at, you know, instead of just taking proton pump inhibitors, she's able to actually do something with her diet that makes her feel better. And then there was Sarah who was struggling with her cold and flu, and she would normally get sick for six to eight weeks and she'd be at a commission. Um, and I've, I've helped teach her how to make herbs. I've actually taken her out shopping for her different herbs to make the concoctions at home so that she could feel empowered that you don't have to just lay in bed and feel sick and succumb to the pain, that there is something that you can physically do about it, inshallah. I do also have one-on-one -on -one coaching for anyone who has health issues, doesn't have the time or energy right now to invest into taking a course or reading a book, but needs immediate relief. I do offer one-on-one um, 90-minute -on -one coaching for anyone who needs that. And that could be done through the website as well, propheticmedicine.com slash coaching. Thank you very much for tuning in. Jazakumullah khairan. I would like to thank um, all the people who are behind the scenes that actually helped make this happen. Um, there, there was a huge team of people that made this in event actually happen today. So first and foremost, I'd like to thank Nabila from uh, Salam Media. She was involved in putting together the website, um, all of this presentation material. She helped with how to do it. She was instrumental in actually getting me to do it. Um, I would like to thank my daughter, Dalia, for putting together the presentation and for my husband for making sure that everything technical worked. Um, the team that stood behind me to enable me to do this and to give me the time where I could focus on working on this and they took on more responsibilities. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming and for believing in me and for giving me the opportunity to share with you my knowledge. Um, I look forward to seeing you again, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum.